This podcast is sponsored by Uncana, trusted natural solutions. Uncana is a leading voice of advocacy for CBD in the veteran LEO and federal communities. Veteran owned and operated, the Uncana team is actively fighting for DOD access to CBD with political pressure, community support, and a simple message. Hashtag Op Natural. Uncana is vertically integrated with industry leaders from seed to sell, supplying premium small batch products to America's best. Use code MENTORS4MIL the number four, M-I-L, at checkout at uncana.com to receive your amazing discount. Read the Mentors for Military disclaimer at mentorsformilitary.com slash disclaimer. At Mentors for Military, we decided that we wanted to help veteran-owned businesses, and that's why we created Veteran Owned U.S., you can visit it at VeteranOwnUS.com. Looking for a veteran business to support? Shop there. If you're a veteran-owned business and you want to list with us, join up by clicking the Join Up tab. VeteranOwnUS at VeteranOwnUS.com. This is the Mentors for Military Podcast. Welcome to the Mentors for Military podcast. I'm Robert, and joining with me is a bunch of co-hosts that you guys probably haven't met before, and we're coming here from lovely Newton, Georgia, in, in uh, 15 Perry Street. Uh, we'd like to give a big shout-out to those guys for giving us their space and stuff to use as a studio for this uh, weekend. And uh, so what I'm going to do before I introduce our guest, I'm going to go kind of around this way and have each of you state who you are, because a lot of people are probably going to be um, hearing this or watching this and going, okay, I, I don't know these people, so let me go ahead and get used to it. So, so I'm Don Fox, and I'm retired uh, U.S. Army. Paul Martinez, former Army Ranger. AJ, active duty, security forces, Air Force. I'm Nikki. I'm retired Navy. I'm Scott Johnson. I'm from uh, the British Army. Okay. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, uh, which is uh, Uncana primarily. And Uncana, of course, if you guys haven't checked those uh, people out, please do. they got great products. You can use the code MENTORS, the number four M-I-L. And uh, you can use their products and stuff using that code, which gives you a 20% discount, normally reserved for LEOs and veterans. And uh, you'd have to get verified and everything else. But for mentors, the number four MIO, you get 20% every day for their products. Good stuff. Seed to sell. They do uh, great work in terms of CGMP, ISO 9001, FDA. Um, so good, good products. Check that out. Tactical Brewing has really uh, up the game uh, this weekend, and we really appreciate the support that they provided us as well. If you haven't checked them out, do so in Orlando, Florida, Tactical Brewing Company, and uh, veteran-owned space, and we really appreciate that. So without further ado, I want to get into uh, today's guest, and Josh and I have actually met. We've known each other now for about three and a half months or so, I guess it was. It was around October time six, frame. Six, Robert, six. No, don't take Don't take that three and a half from me. <laughs> 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 and uh, so Josh and his wife, Nicole, and my wife, uh, we were all t- were together at, at uh, I don't know, at, at com- an offsite or something that we ended up doing together. And, and right. in that, um, we got a, really a good bond. It turned out his wife was from the same location. Unfortunately, Josh is a Florida State fan, so we'll, we won't oh, have that against him. I knew you were going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at any rate, uh, I want to get into a little bit of your background, because I think with what's going on in today's society, there's so many different things, um, and we'll get into a little bit of that. And then we're going to jump into what I told you I wanted to talk about, too, in, in, um, in cybersecurity and those types of things as well. But I want to start at the very beginning because I'm quite frankly, I, I want to know how, uh, you know, you tie into Tallahassee and to Florida and all of that kind of good stuff and what, you know, how that all began and where it is that you came in from the military. Because I don't even know this part of the story. Yeah. So um, born and raised in Tallahassee. Um, right. So that's how I became a Seminoles fan. Either you're a Seminoles fan in Tallahassee or you kind of get ostracized down to the bad part of Florida, which is kind of like central Florida, right around Gainesville. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, born and raised there, uh, really, you know, both my parents were very, you know, blue collar. My dad was, you know, my dad was an army guy, uh, national guard guy. Um, you know, grew up on a dirt road. Like I, like my, you know, we were not poor by any means, Red but clay. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, we, we were not poor by any means, but, you know, when you did not go eat at restaurants uh, every week, like you went to a restaurant on your birthday and that was about it. And, yeah. you know, that restaurant was typically, you know, you got to pick like Sonny's Barbecue or the Huddle House. Yeah. Um, 
or, so, or, or it could be Scott's favorite, which Denny's. is Denny's or uh, Denny's, right? Oh yeah, everybody in America eats in Denny's. Yeah, yeah Denny's. You know, I have a national no. restaurant. Like growing up, you know, like my mom would be like, you know, I like Olive Garden was a fancy, a fancy restaurant, you oh, know, yeah. growing up for me. So Red Lobster. Um, oh yeah, dude, Red Lobster was out of the question. Yeah, like, <laughs> those biscuits. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I kind of came into the uh, came into the army from from there. Um, you know, went through uh, Memphis and Jacksonville, and uh, kind of wound up at Fort Leonard Wood, uh, Missouri, in November. First time ever seeing snow. Fort Leonard Wood, really? Um, yeah, yeah. What was Fort your MOS then? What did you end up going into initially? So I, I I've, I've been a counter intel guy. Uh, I didn't know my, that was a Fort Leonard Wood. Why did I not know that? I mean, you go to Fort Jackson or Fort Leonard Wood if you're an intel nerd. Um, okay. I just drew Leonard Wood. Okay. You know, however they however they do that. That's not so, where the AIT is at, though. No, so the AIT for for all of us is, is at Fort Huachuca. Okay, that, um, in now Arizona. it makes sense. It's about an hour south. So of the Tucson. basic you go first to either Fort Jackson or yeah, or okay. Fort Leonard Wood. Yeah, there's no OSET for for Intel guys. Yeah, um, they want to get us out of there as soon as they can. I get, you know, like OSET, everybody goes OSET, right? But yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah. Not for not for us nerds. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the army actually wasn't my first choice. Um, my, my dad being an army guy tried to talk me into joining the air force. Yeah. Actually, my dad was like, that's like two already. Go ahead. (laughs) My, you know, my dad was like, it's better quality of life. Well, my mother would say the same thing. Better barracks. Yeah. Better housing. My dad Better BX. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so my dad was like, do not be, (laughs) (laughs) you know, my dad was like, you know, don't be an army guy. And I was like, no, I want to be an army guy. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's hard headed. I'm 18 years old. I know everything. I know infinitely more than him. Um, you know, it was like, no, I want to be an army guy. My dad's like, don't be an army guy. So I went to, uh, went to see the army recruiter. He was like, eh, you know, take the ASVAB, all that, all that jazz. And so came back, you know, scored decent on the ASVAB. And so my dad was like, all right, hey, what are you, what are you thinking? I was like, I want to be 11 Bravo because, you know, that, that was one of, the, one of the MOSs that he had. He had two. And uh, I was like, I want to be 11 Bravo. My dad's like, again, I need you to listen to me. He was like, do not be an infantry guy. He was like, get something that you can, you know, if you decide to get out after a couple of years, you can really market yourself, you know, do something with computers, do something with signal, do something, you know, that, you know, you get a skill. Sure. And so... Again, going back to that, you know, not not listening. I was like, I want to be an MP. Um, <laughs> that was like, again, you, for once in your life, listen to what I'm telling you. And so he was like, you need to do something along those lines. Um, so then, you know, then my girlfriend, now my wife, Nicole's sister, was an interrogator in the army. Really? Yeah. And I so, didn't know that. yep. And so she told me she was like, hey, she goes, you know. They have this job. You get to wear civilian clothes. And I was like, perfect. I can be in the Army, but kind of not in the Army. Yes, that's for me. So I go do everything. I get to MEPS, and they're like, what's that scar on your chest? I was like, oh, I had open heart surgery when I was a kid. And they were like, yeah, we're not going to let you in the Army. Oh, wow. So that was my initial, like, that was a long three-hour, you know, three-hour drive back from Jacksonville. You went to the Mets and everything at this point then? Yeah. Oh, okay. My recruiter had told me, have you ever had any surgeries? I was like, well, I had open heart surgery. And he was like, let me see the scar. So him and, like, the station commander had me take my shirt off. They look at the scar, like, they're not going to notice that. Oh. Right? And so, <laughs> so I get the Mets no, and they're they like. didn't. Yeah, I get the Mets and they're <laughs> like, oh, yeah, bro, you can't be in the army. Like, no, get out of yeah, here. Yeah. Um, so. That was my initial kind of, re, you know, rejection um, from, from the military. And so I decided to enroll in community college. I was like, you know what, graduate high school, like I'll go to community college for a couple of years, get yeah. my associates, then go on to a university and get, some my ba- get my bachelor's. So the first year went really well. Um, you know, registered early, so I got the good classes. Didn't have to be, you know, didn't start classes till like 10, 10.30 in the morning. And when That's was kind of right what, in my wheelhouse. What year? So this was 95. Okay. Um, so this is 95, right? So register early was good. Went to class. Like I'm not doing anything, not going out with friends or anything during the week, uh, study nights, everything. Right. So the next year rolled around, I registered late for classes. And I really think that like, that was my downfall. 
um, because all those like 10 30 11 o'clock classes were gone it was like oh you want 7 30 algebra 2 7 30 mm-hmm. calculus okay you're like dude i don't i wouldn't do it 7 30 in the morning then yeah um so who does right yeah so kind of started dropping some classes stopped going to class um realized started going out it was like hey man it's uh you know it's half price wednesdays let's uh you know, let's go out during the week. It's just one night. It's fine, right? So that became every night. And then eventually, you know, a couple of years later, I found myself like, I don't have any more money. Mom and dad were like, we're not paying for you to party. Mm. You know, um, you, you, you need to figure your life out. This is, when, this is when you make adult decisions and make adult choices. Right. Um, so went back to the recruiter. And, you know, again, they were like, you're gonna have to get your paperwork and a doc to sign off saying that you know you're not gonna die on us. So they were like, you need your first. It was like you know you you need your original records from your surgery. I was like, bro, that was in 1983. Like, pretty sure that doctor's dead. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And back then, you know, open heart surgery was not what it is today. No, you know, it's basically it's almost very out, invasive. Yeah, yeah, it's almost an out <clears throat> outpatient procedure today. You know, I spent a week in ICU after it in 1983. Yeah. Um, you know, they they weren't screening blood for you know HIV back then. They knew nothing. Um, so I really lucked out, and uh, so you know, said no. This is what I want to do. Like I have to do something. I recognize that. I can't work minimum wage jobs the rest of my life. Like, it's just, I'm not doing it. Yeah. Um, and so went back, you know, got, got all the paperwork, got all the waivers. Um, I was going to say, was this a waiver process that they Yeah, had? it yeah. was a waiver process. Like, and I had to all get the way up to USAREC and, and uh, the yep. whatever MEPS command. Yeah. Yep. And I even had to, I had to get a letter from my congressman. Really? Um, yeah, saying, please approve the waiver. Oh, wow. Like, that's what level it was at. And that's how, ba- that's how bad I wanted in. Um, you know, it was crazy because. It wasn't, I wanted to join the army because of, you know, because of patriotism or, you know, sense of duty or anything like that. That would make for a great story, but that wasn't it. Like, I was just tired of working minimum wage jobs. And I figured, you know, the army at least give me a skill. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, people who joined the army for, you know, patriotism and how true, like, good on you. Like, I didn't do it. Um, So, but yeah. So, you know, finally got approved. They said, yep, you're good. Ship went to basic and uh, again saw snow for the first time. Froze during basic. I was so excited to be going to Southern Arizona when I graduated at the end of January '98, and then I get to Southern Arizona and realize Fort Huachuca sits at like 5,300 feet, and there's like two feet of snow on the ground when I get there. And I just kind of nice. like. <sighs> What did your Florida boy just do? Yeah. So yeah. well, you arrived there and everything. How long was your uh, AIT then? Um, so that was rather, those were long, right? Those schools. Well, that school was only four months. Um, okay. I decided to make it a little bit longer and, uh, and recycled. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Enjoyed it so much. Yeah. You know what? Hey, you know, more. you're in Southern Arizona, make the most of it. Um, so not going to see much know, snow in Florida again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do more. Kind of going back to, you know, back to my childhood, I've always had a problem with authority. Yeah. Um, even if I want to do something, I'm probably going to go do it anyway. But as soon as you tell me to do it, I'm not going to do it just yeah. based on sheer principle. Right. Um, so, you know, my uh, my drill sergeant and I in AIT, we didn't see eye to eye on how I should do things. So, uh, so I spent some extra time there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Decided to take the longer course. Yep. So um, you went counterintelligence. Mm-hmm. So for people who are may not be even familiar with what that is. Help us understand what a counterintelligence person does so, and what your, your training entailed. So the training, like, so your, you know, your initial uh, entry training entails four months out of Fort Huachuca where you become uh, a, what they call a badge and credentials counterintelligence uh, agent. So really counterintelligence, the easiest way to put it is, you know, think about what our human intelligence guys do. We try and find out and, you know, shape, uh, here's what the enemy, you know, the the sit temp looks like um, for a counter intel guy we're trying to keep the bad guys human guys from collecting on us yeah i don't know if that that's probably no, the no, easiest that, way that, to put it yeah that, that makes helps sense. you know we're trying to protect our secrets um and you know keep the keep the enemy from getting those yeah keep the russians out of the uh, politics and everything oh yeah that probably <laughs> that, that's a separate podcast <laughs> 
So <clears throat> training was four months. After you left there, where did you end up going? So it was, uh, I wound up at Fort Bragg. Um, you know, they come out and they're calling out. Was orders. that by choice or they just kind of like called no, your number? No, no, I, I was an E2. Like there was no, like you, you had no choices um, yeah. at all in the matter. So it came out and they were calling out all these duty stations. Um, you know, so, you know, drill sergeant has everybody. It's like, all right, I got everybody's orders for, you know, for your first duty station. He's calling out and my friends are going to Germany. They're going to Fort Meade, you know, civilian clothes. Like one of my buddies went to Panama because, um, you know, Clayton and Sherman were still open at the time. Um, and so this is uh, early fall 98. Yeah. Um, right. So this still open. I'm like, yeah, man, Panama, you know, Germany, like, sounds awesome. You know, he calls my name. He's like, yeah, you're going to Fort Bragg. It was like. That makes me sad. <laughs> um, so, I tell but you had you, never been to Fort, you had never been to North Carolina or anything, because no, like I had been backpacking to the mountains, like you know, as a kid, something yeah, like yeah. that. But, but you know, never been to Fort Bragg or, right. or, or Fayetteville, um, the the sprawling metropolis. But I tell you though, in hindsight, the best thing that ever happened to me was going to Fort Bragg as a private. Why? Because you learn how to be a Joe like you learn how to be a soldier before you learn how to be your MOS like the best thing was walking around Fort Bragg as a private like there was no there was no safety at all anywhere um, you know you you just you learn how the army worked mm -hmm. um, you know down down at that that company and battalion level were you in the 82nd division no 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 so where, um, where did you end up going into that so I, I wound up at 525 at my brigade um, so it was basically the 18th Airborne Corps support brigade so any uh, any unit in 18th Airborne Corps if they yeah. needed they needed MI guys you guys were then we, assigned you know, yeah we we were um, attached to them attached okay that's what I meant yeah so you know that I tell you though you know I got to do a lot of great things um, I got to meet a lot of phenomenal people and, you know, there was a few people, there was a lot of people, but you know, there was a few people there that set me up for success for the rest of my career. Um, you know, so? because they were hard because oh. they were hard on me. And so, yeah, no, That's absolutely. Like, and yeah. My, leaders, my yeah. platoon sergeant, um, like he was the guy, like he would you would see his truck pull into the parking lot for pt formation and everybody would just it would be like a collective sigh right it's like god i wish this guy i wish this guy would take leave yeah. i wish this guy would go to a school go tdy like something i yeah. wish this guy was not here yeah right because you knew it was just gonna suck um but again hindsight's always 2020 but looking back you know after you know years down the road you're like that was what I needed. That was the person I needed at the time I needed the most. Um, he was he, he was he was a phenomenal NCO. Um, we had phenomenal warrant officers. Um, yeah, it's just hmm. you know I mean, and we did everything that you could do wrong as you know privates, right? So there's a group of us, and I still talk to a lot of them, you know, to this day. You know, straight from the bar to PT formation. Right, and you just show up, and he, he knows. Nothing like reeking of alcohol yeah. on a four-mile run or whatever. Yeah. yeah, and so you know, you show up, and it wasn't, it wasn't. Well, go ahead and take you down to the MP station. It was just, looks like today's a run day. Yeah, and you were like, oh, yeah, man, you sweat that stuff out. And so yeah. there was train tracks right behind the, our battalion and brigade area, so we would go run the train tracks. Oh, yeah. Really? Run the train tracks while you're still drunk. Not a good time. <laughs> Trip and fall on the train tracks where the gravel's, you know, like size of softballs. Right, right. Not a good time. <clears throat> Not a good time. So those it's instances, good training, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would have taken that over take, getting taken down to the MP station yeah, to yeah. something that would have been detrimental to, you know. Yeah, but getting on the career. blotter report wouldn't have been a good thing. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Getting on the blotter report would have been a good thing, but... Yeah. You know, again, like you, know, you hear a lot of people talk about how they were, you know, they were in the military and they just, you know, all their leaders were bad and all their NCOs were bad. I've, I have been blessed in my career that the vast majority of my leadership has been phenomenal. Yeah. Has absolutely been phenomenal. Well, that actually, like for me, I had a very similar situ situation where the, I wouldn't say it was, it wasn't the first platoon sergeant, it was probably my second one. Um, that made such a major impact on me. And it's amazing how someone like that can be such a tremendous mentor that really set the tone for the rest of your career. At least I can say that for myself. 
I happen to be very fortunate to run into the right type of person at the right time, you know, in my life that I needed that to kind of motivate me and get me going. You yeah, know? for sure. Sounds I, like the same thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, I've found myself time and time again, you know, in situations, especially when, you know, I became a platoon sergeant, you know, what would he do? Like, how would, how would he take a look at this situation? And, That's really cool. Yeah. And, you know, not like everything he did wasn't perfect, um, but, you know, he... Again, hindsight, like, you know, looking back, like, he was exactly who I needed when I needed it. I didn't realize it then, you know. Well, but. of course not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you end up going to airborne school before, or were, did you, they end up sending you to airborne school at some point? Because, I mean, if you're 18. Yeah, so it was then. Okay. Um, and so, you know, did that. Um, guys that I graduated AIT with, after we, we deployed to Kosovo after the initial push, um, K, so K41 Alpha, right? So I'm a brand new, probably first class on my first deployment, you know, um, feeling, feeling pretty awesome. And uh, so we came back from that and guys were coming down with orders for Korea, mm. going to 2ID and I was just like, man, I don't, I don't want to go In to Korea. In your unit. Yeah. And so, you know, guys were going to 2ID. Um, I didn't want to go to 2ID, I didn't want to go to Korea. And so they turned around and uh, so I, I called my branch manager because I'd always been told very young, like, nobody's going to take care of you better than you and take charge of your career. You know, the army is going to manage your career how it sees fit, but yep. that may not be the best way. Yep. And so, you know, as a specialist, I picked up the phone and called my branch manager and was like, what do you have? Really? Yeah, absolutely. That's bold. I, How'd you get that number anyway? One of my warrants gave it to me. Really? Yeah, one of my warrants. Um, gave it to me and uh, he was like, here's your branch manager. He was a great warrant. And so he was like, here you go, call the branch manager and ask him. And I called and asked, uh, you know, what, what do you have open? What's going on? And he said, I have Korea 2ID or Puerto Rico. And it was like, I'll no go ahead and take Puerto Rico. And he was like, you're gonna have to re-enlist for it. I was like, you'll have it today. So I walked straight <laughs> up to the, to the retention NCO. I was like, I need to re-enlist. He was like, all right, so let's take your list of paperwork. He's like, yeah, man, you around next week? I was like, no, I was kind of like looking like now. Yeah, yeah. Um, dude, I signed the papers, got my coffee cup and my pen, and walked and found a fax machine. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, and uh, probably about six months later, I was on my way, on my way to Puerto Rico. Three years there? So we did, uh, so it was two years. Um, I was in Puerto Rico when they closed down U.S. Army South and moved everybody to San Antonio. Um, so I was yeah, there, yeah. I was there in Puerto Rico when they turned the lights off. Um, so yeah, Port Puerto Rico was a great time. Um, I had a, had single. an apartment. I was single, you know, for the first year I was there. Um, I had a great time. I had an apartment, right, a condo right on the beach. Um, it was, yeah, it was, it was out of control. Um, I spent, I spent a lot of time in, uh, central South America. Uh, hey. I lived in Honduras for six months. Um, it was in Bolivia for three, Ecuador for three. Columbia. Like I had, uh, what's that? Colombia? No, I never made it to Colombia. The closest I made it to Colombia was Northern Ecuador up in the, uh, Esmeraldas region. Okay. Um, way up North of Quito. Mm -hmm. But, uh. Okay. So we're going to quiz you here. Did you learn to speak Spanish? Or, you know, any type of. So. If, so that's a it's, that's a funny story. So when I'm watching Wachuca going through AIT, everybody's yeah. taking the uh, the D Lab because everybody wants to go to DLI, right? right. Everybody's like, I want to yeah. go to Monterey, California for yeah. a year on right. the government who, who wouldn't? Yeah. Um, so I went and took the D Lab. When I walked out of the D Lab, I was like, they are going to reclass me into a cook because I'm the <laughs> dumbest person on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody has anybody taken the D Lab. I I didn't. Did you guys? No. No. no? So it's a made up language. Right, so there's, you, it's not one you can study for. And so the army was like, no, you're stupid. You cannot learn a foreign language. You are not gonna go waste our money in Monterey. Um, so I was like, okay, thanks. I'll just go, <laughs> go back over here and go to Fort Bragg um, with the rest of the nugs. And so I get down to Puerto Rico and just through immersion yes. and then going to Honduras, just through immersion, you're you either learn it or you just struggle. Like you're gonna be on the struggle bus all, you know, every day. And so just do immersion. Um, I went back and I actually took the DLPT and I was like one plus one plus. I was pretty proud of that. That's um, not bad. So not enough, you know, not enough to get paid, but enough to turn around and, you know, tell the army be like, your test sucks. I am smart. <laughs> um, so 
it was uh, so I, I did learn to speak enough Spanish. Like I could get by, I could pick up like every third, fourth word in the conversation. I, I stayed like two years in Germany and I learned enough to get to the train station in case I'm too drunk. How to order the beers ahead of time, you know, those types of things. But yeah, but not work related. <laughs> but but I mean, there's a lot of uh, you know the English speaking people in Puerto Rico, so it's not like you really had to struggle too much, right? No, you didn't have to struggle too much. The, the, the thing was, but in San Juan, it was really easy. Um, you know, to get by with, with just English. If you went out of San Juan yeah, to the rest of the island, the outskirts, yeah. you know, then all, almost everybody speaks English. Um, but a lot of a lot of folks don't want to, um, you know, and and that was fine. I, I appreciated that yeah. because it forced me to learn, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I got out of San Juan like every chance I could was you know get out of the city and get to the west side of the island you know the south side of the island hmm. um in south so it was a good time man. I, had, I i had a great time in puerto rico after puerto rico what happened so they shut uh, u.s army south down and they moved everybody to san antonio texas and you you got moved as yeah a, I as got an moved element to, okay yeah okay. so they moved they they moved the entire company there um of us and you know i call branch I said, I really don't want to go to Texas. I don't want to go to San Antonio. Um, you know, what do you have? And Branch is like, sorry, you know, once you get there, your clock starts again. No so way, you're because gonna, it's yeah. a new PCS. Beca- yeah, because they viewed it as a PCS. Oh. Um, and so that wasn't the answer that I wanted to hear. No, no, I can't um, imagine. So <laughs> by this time. Nothing against San Antonio or anything. But. You know, we, we were in San Antonio for six months. Um, it is a absolutely phenomenal city yeah it's the cost of living is not big city cost of living right when we were there it's a i mean it's massive but it still has a small town feel to it Mm -hmm. they really really like san antonio um but i didn't like it in the summer like it was excruciatingly it was was so hot it was miserable um so again like i'm not not excited to be stuck there for three years right and uh by this point nicole and i are married and so you know so how did you, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't go into this, but how did you guys meet then if you were in San Antonio? <laughs> so Nicole and I met before I joined the Army. Um, oh, really? Yeah, we kind of did the, the on again, off again oh, okay, uh, right. thing for, you know, for a while. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Until, I finally, in, until I finally got my mind right and, uh, you know, realized that uh, she, she was the one. Um, it took me a while to get there, yeah. um, you know, not, not because of her, but because of me. Yeah. Um, so anyway, you get married. I don't want to go too yep. much. <laughs> So you get married. That's another podcast. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't. I'd rather have her on when we do that. Yeah. So you end up getting married there, and you're in San Antonio. So what what ends so, up happening? So we got married actually in Puerto Rico. So she came down to Puerto Rico, and like you know, it was like nine months later, we're like we're gone. Yeah. You know, to San Antonio. So the uh, I don't know if it was the MI MI course art major, the ENSCOM art major. Somebody was visiting us in San Antonio and said, "I need people for this new thing called Striker Brigade." in Alaska and I love hunting and fishing. I was like, sign me up. And I was, you know, me being me, I have to get my dig in. So I'm like, well, the branch manager said that I can't leave, you know, I have to stay here for three years. And you know, the sergeant manager's like, I'll take care of that. Um, So my branch manager at the time, probably not a fan. Yeah, Uh, (laughs) yeah, yeah. And uh, so next thing you know, like we're on orders for Alaska. So. I mean, we haven't even finished unpacking boxes in San Antonio, and they're like, you're going to Alaska, um, which it seemed like a really good idea. The airborne unit up there? Or? No. So this is Striker Brigade okay. in Fairbanks. Okay. Um, they, weren't, they weren't part of the airborne unit? This no, time. no. It was a battalion down at Fort Rich in Anchorage. Oh, okay. That was the, uh, the airborne unit. I would say it was like 4th Battalion out of 25th ID. Okay. Um, they, well, I knew there was I one up there. I just yeah. didn't know where. Yeah, yeah they're down in, uh, in Anchorage at Fort, okay. uh, Fort Richardson. Um, so we get on the plane in San Antonio, it is 85 degrees in November. When we got off the plane that night in Fairbanks, yeah. it was negative 23. <laughs> <Dang>. <laughs> Hello. And Nicole is just looking at me like, what have you done? Uh, <laughs> it was not excited. Uh. It was, uh, it was brutal. Um, and you know, spend, uh, spent a lot of time there. Um, I spent a lot of time gone, um, yeah. uh, you know, Iraq, 16 months in Iraq from there. Um, really? wow, that's a long time. You know, it, it wasn't supposed to be 16 months. Yeah. How'd that, 
So we got our orders. You're, right, you're going to Mosul for 12 months, right? Standard, your standard year long, uh, you know, big army deployment. We did our 12 months in Mosul, literally the day we packed and sealed our, our connexes. Like the MPs were walking away. They had just done the customs inspection and we get this message. They're like, hey, all the E7s and above, you need to go to the uh, theater on, I wanna say it was Mares, was the, was the big fob there at the airfield in Mosul. And uh, hey, brigade commander wants to talk to everybody. All the E7s and above go. So we all go over there. And, uh, we're, you know, you, you walk in and you're like, oh, this is a, you know, hey, good job. You know, you did, you know, yeah, you did right, good right. Work. yeah, all right, we're going home. And it was no, go unpack your shit. You're going to Baghdad for four months. And a lot of, a lot of sad people. Um, I was one of them. It was, that one was tough. That yeah. one was really tough. We had our, well, psychologically, and, you had already like, oh yeah, you're done. Like we had yeah. turned it, we had turned in ammo, um, the Strecker Brigade out of uh, Lewis had already replaced us. Like we had already done our left seat, right seat rides. Like we, we, they had taken over as the BSO. Like we were done. And we already had our Avon and Torch Party was already back in Alaska. So we had like 250, 300 guys already on the ground in Alaska, you know, waiting to receive the main bodies. They had to pack their stuff and come back. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the truly, truly tragic part of that is there were six or seven of those guys that had already got back to Alaska and home that had to come back, got killed in Baghdad. Oh, um, man. And so that one was, that, that was probably, as far as like that goes, like that was probably the hardest deployment that I've done um, by far. Just, I don't care who you are, 16 consecutive, that's a long time. Yeah, Like that is, that is just, that is a long, long time. Um, and so this was, you know, 05, 06, the height of, you know, so it was the height of sectarian violence. Um, you know, Baghdad was on fire. Um, you know, Mosul was on fire. Like, the, you know, the whole country was burning down. And so, like, that one was really, that one was really tough. That was a hard deployment, uh, mm. mentally and, phys- you know, physically, because, man, 16 months, it's a long time. Yeah. It's yeah. a long time, even for the, you know, conventional units. You know, Spain, uh, staying up there three years. Yeah. So as soon I, I so I called my branch manager from Iraq, um, from Baghdad oh, before I even got back. And I was like, you know, I said, Hey, I said, I don't know what your plans are for me as like, but here's what I want to do. And so the branch manager was like, well, I was going to send you, I had you tagged for first Cav at Fort hood at Fort hood. And first Cav was early in Baghdad with us. And I was like, Hey, so check this out. It's like, I don't know if you're tracking. I don't know if you got the memo, but we've been here for 16 months. The last thing I want to do is go back and, you know, take a knee for six months and right. then come back for another year. Like, yes. I, like I can't do that. Right. Um, and so, you know, so it branch was like, oh, you know, I've, you know, every, I can't please everybody, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, that's fine. Go Go not please someone else. Yeah. Um, I how need about, you to please me this time. How about you and I switch? <laughs> yeah. How about you go? Right. Right, right. Um, and so, like, and so in, in this deployment, too, so our second daughter was born um, while, I was in, while I was in Iraq. Mm. Um, you know, Nicole got pregnant while I was on R&R leave. And I was going to be back in time, you know, for our second daughter being born. But then the extension pushed me past that point. So I didn't, I didn't even meet my second daughter until she was like two months, two, two and a half months old. Wow, that's tough. Yeah, so it was, it was just incredibly tough. It was incredibly tough on Nicole because she's dealing, you know, I mean, one, she has our, you know, our oldest daughter. Mm-hmm. They're two years apart. So she has a two-year-old yeah. on top of a newborn. Yeah. You know, and she's in Alaska. All our family's in the southeast U.S. Right. And she's five months pregnant when you tell her the news you're not coming home. Right. And, yeah, yeah. it was that was not an easy conversation. That was not a fun conversation. Um, you know, and so all I knew that when I came back, when I was talking to Branch, I was either at that point, I was either getting out of the Army because I wasn't in def yet. Or I was getting out of the commissional army. Like yeah. one of the two things was happening. Um, You're an E7, so how many years did you have in? Like about 10, 11 at this time? No, no, seven. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> man, I made seven and seven. Yeah. Um, and only because, you know, only because we had two wars going on, not because I was anything special. Yeah. Um, but the board, the seven board was convened when I hit my seven year mark. Um, I didn't have That's a really DA. Good. I didn't even have a DA photo. 
Yeah. Uh, that's because I was like, you know, I looked at it before we deployed. I you was were like, just that good. No. <laughs> I looked at it before we deployed. I was like, there's no way I'm going to get promoted to seven that quick. Surprise. So I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. And then lo and behold, I get a phone call from my first heart one morning. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm drinking coffee. He was like, why is the Army's newest, you know, surfer class not at work? I was like, what? He was like, yeah, you made it. I was like, hmm. Hmm. But no. Uh, was Secondary not anticipating zone? that. Yeah, it was first look. Secondary. Oh, like, wow. Seven and seven. You had to wait like about 12, 18 months before you pinned it? No, or? I pinned probably within five. Wow, that's quick. Yeah. It was, it was like it's super crazy. And again, like I wasn't the only one. There was a lot of other guys that were making it. I, you know, a buddy of mine made Master Sergeant 11. Yeah. You know, so, it, hey man, they needed people for Iraq. So you're talking to this dude and you're like, hey, I'm over it. I'm not going to first cab. What happened? So, you know, it, I, I got the... Uh, I got the righteous indignation, you know, about how hard their job was and everything. And I get it. Like being the branch manager kind of sucks because nobody likes you because you can't please everybody. Um, you know, it's like having kids. Like we have three daughters. If I can, we can make two of them happy. Like we're winning. Like we're good. Like it's a hell of a batting average, right? Yeah. Um, so finally, you know, she comes back and she, she's like, hey, I have uh, a position at Fort Belvoir. It's a nominative position within USASOC that you can apply for if you want. I was like, done. Now, what, who do I need to call? Who do I need to send what to? You know, what do you need? Now, having been at 18th Airborne Corps, you knew a lot about USASOC while you were there. Or, um, or is this I like... I mean, I knew about USASOC. I didn't care. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like, I, I didn't care. I had a lot of friends that were, you know, inside USASOC. Um, you know, that I bumped into in Iraq, you know, at the various FOB and stuff like that. And they were like, hey, what are you doing? You know, why are you... Like, why are you in the conventional unit? Or we like, you know, you need to come over here and live the good life. Yeah. Um, and everything. And I was Special like, Operations Command, if anybody's wondering. So, yeah. United States Army. And, and so I jumped on that. She was like, you, you got to apply for it. You're going to have to interview. I was like, done. Easy. Like, not a problem. He was like, well, if you don't make it, then, you know, you're going to come back. And I'm going to say, it was like, we'll fall off that bridge when we get there. Um, it was like, I, <laughs> absolutely. And so I, uh, I went, you know, interviewed and, uh, and everything, you know, got hired. Yeah. And so we left Alaska, went to, uh, went to DC. Um, so. DC. Yeah. Yeah. So I was at Fort Belvoir, um, right there in the D in Northern Virginia, DC. It's all the, I, it's yeah. the same to me. And what year was this now? This was like right around 2001 then, right? 2000. No, no, oh, this was, yeah, this was. January. So by, that conversation happened before I left Baghdad. So that was like mid 06, I think. So like, yeah, we were there by the end, like December 06, like we were in, we were in DC. What was the difference in the transition between being conventional to being in special operations for you and especially in your MOS? Um, there, there wasn't a lot of, uh, there was a lot of transition. I, I would say probably the biggest part of it was all of a sudden I go from, I can't go to the gym and do PT by myself on the conventional side. And now, you know, on the, on the special operations side, you know, it's like, Hey man, dude, like you gotta, you, you put that in your schedule wherever it fits. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you have just an incredible amount more of, of autonomy. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you don't have to go ask, you know, you don't have to get a mother may I for anything. So that kind of took a little bit of getting used to, cause I was used to having to go, you know, ask for, Hey, can, you know, can we do this? I need to reserve this training area. I need to do, you know, this, I got to fill out this form, you know, for this. I, well, I can't go talk to the S one cause I don't have a pack slip. And they're like, dude, just go in there and talk to them. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? And so I, I relate it back to, um, Morgan Freeman's character in Shawshank Redemption, mm -hmm. right? So when he gets out of prison, like he's in the grocery store, he's like, I need to go to the bathroom. He's like, you don't have to ask me to go to the bathroom. You just go, right? So that, that's kind of what it was like. It was yeah. kind of like getting out of prison. Um, that's it, sad. It, yeah, it was, it was terrible. It was like, <laughs> it, I, I, I knew at the end of that deployment, that's why I said it was like, I'm either getting out of the Army yeah. or I'm getting out of the commission. Like one of the two is happening. Um, you know, if I got to get out of the army, then I'm getting out of the army. I was still well under 10 years. So it was like, not a big deal. Yeah. Um, I just couldn't live. I could not live inside that box anymore. You know, coupled with my, my problem with authority on top of that. Like mm -hmm. I just, I, like I could not do it. 
So at some point, though, you end up going to warrant officer. Uh, going the, that yeah. Um, so while I'm at Belvoir, um, you know, I was there for a couple of years, you know, in, in, in USASOC. And so I had a great time, got to do a lot of things, got to do a lot of things that I never had the you know, opportunity to do before. And so some friends of mine um, were in another organization up at, uh, up at Fort Meade that still ran inside the same circles and everything. And they were like, you can come up here and you can do, you know, these 10 different things or you can stay there and do the one different thing. Like I was having a lot of fun, but I was like, man, there's now I can go do nine more different things. Like, yeah. I want to go do that. Um, like what schools did you already have? You, did you already have so like by uh, that point, like I had been jump, to Halo. No, no, so I, no, no, I had not, I had not Halo. Um, um, they, they're not going to like, they're going to send the Intel nerd to, uh, to, to Halo school. Um, so I had a lot of, by that point I had, um, one of, you know, a CI source op school. Um, so I had a lot of CI centric okay. uh, training by then. Top but secret I, level. No. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, not, not like secret, super spook schools, but just like, you know, interviewing and investigating school techniques, um, mm. you know, and stuff. And, uh, so, but I had not been to the CI case officer course, you know, yet. And so moving up to Fort Meade would allow me to do that. I would add, cause all those uh, billets up there were case officer slots. And so I was like, absolutely. Like I want to do that, you know, cause that's just the next logical step in career progression for me. Yeah. And so I, you know, I put in a packet, you know, had to, it was, you know, a week long assessment selection, um, got hired. And uh, so I was there for a little over seven years and that's where I went warrant. Okay. Um, was right in there. Um, I was a master sergeant by this time. Yeah. And, uh, and, and is, was that more like a natural career progression too, to go from like an E8 to warrant? No, no, it's not natural at so, all. Most, so why did you end up doing that? Cause I, I that's what I wanted to know. What, so what caused you to go that route? I didn't want to be a sergeant major. Oh really? Why? Because I would have promoted myself out of a job. Um, even C Sergeant major, not CSM, just Sergeant major, just a regular Sergeant yeah. major. Yeah. I would have, the unit that I was in had one Sergeant major billet and this guy had been in the billet for like seven years. Okay. Like, so it was like you, if I, if I competed for Sergeant major and I made it <coughs> on that off chance, I would have had to leave and I would have had to go back out to big army to wherever the big army needed Sergeant majors at. And the last thing I ever wanted to be was a sergeant major in the big army. Gotcha. Right. Okay. And so <laughs> yeah. at that point it was like, okay, well I can either be, you know, a career master sergeant, um, or even, I don't know if they had changed the rules then to where if you declined it, declined to compete, then that started the separation process or not. I can't remember. If, I, I don't know if it was that time or not, but warrant had kind of always been in my plans. Um, but the timing had never been there yeah. for me. You know, when I had the opportunity to, you know, go to Fort Belvoir, I couldn't go as a warrant. I had, you know, I had to be an NCO because that's what the billets were. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just put off going warrant, you know, go here. And then the same thing, we're like, okay, you can come to Fort Me, but we need NCOs. We don't need warrants. So I was like, okay, I'll put it off and, you know, go do this. Um, so did you have to go to like warrant officer, candidate school, that type of stuff? Yeah, and I went to, went to Fort Rucker and got my, uh, got my five weeks of uh, sanctioned army hazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i've heard that's a lot of fun uh as far as like it's almost like another basic training all over again with it's it's worse than basic training um especially since you've already been in the army as long as you had yes yeah. right so i showed up i was a master sergeant um i show up and first off people are looking at me they're like why are you here yeah. But you do come on. Are well, you most here? of them are going to like flight school and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Are you assigned to the same Yeah, you're everybody's all in the same class, yeah. right? So okay. the way they the way they break it up is so if you're in if you're a sergeant or above and you have attended um PLDC, I don't know, I forget what they're calling it these yeah, days. What are they calling um, PLDC so now? I'm updating myself. Um, boy, your leader, boy, your leader oh, yeah, your leader yeah. So if you're a sergeant or above with WLC, then you're in the five week class. If you're, you know, a high school to flight school guy, then you're in the seven week class. Uh, two like, weeks, okay. Two weeks makes a big difference, huh? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so you know, so I show up and, yep. Yeah, but you're in there with, you know, you're in there with everybody else, and you know, show up and they're like, kind of like, why are you here? And, you know, I was a master sergeant with 13 years in, and, and they're just kind of like, yeah, really? I was like, dude, I want to be a sergeant major. And they're like, all right, let's go, go get in the grass with everybody else. 
Um, now, you guys are totally stripped at this point of your rank or anything, right? Because yeah. you're just now a candidate. Yeah, you're just a candidate. Like, you have. You're, yeah. Yeah, a candidate, you know, quickly Go back becomes to zero a, again. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Candidate becomes a four-letter word. Okay, so uh, dumb really question. Quick. What happens to you if you fail? You just go back to your NCO rank and back on. Oh, you okay. Know, yeah. Um, so they don't they don't drop you or anything then. At that, like, I, I I don't know for whatever reason. I no. think they might like. Nope. Okay. You, you you go back to your NCO rank and you go back out to, you know, the, Need, the, needs army. Of the army. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was kind of fortunate where I was. I was TDY in return. You know, so I knew exactly where I was going back to. I wasn't even moving desk. Um, you know, so you just had to get your ticket, punch it. I just had to go down there and check that block and, and, yeah. and be done with it. But candidate school was so much harder than basic training because the basic training, like you're a private, you, you don't know shit. You're like, you know, when you're raking lines in the dirt, you're like, that's some Mr. Miyagi stuff. Like, I, I don't know when I'm going to need this, but like, there's going to come a time when I'm gonna be like, dude, I'm going to uh, like, I'm going to save the world with this right here. By the time you make it, you know, you're a warrant officer candidate school, raking lines in the dirt. You're like, you're just wasting my time. This is nonsense. <laughs> like this has zero training value whatsoever. Yeah. And so I'm sure they thought it was important it, though. Oh yeah. They think every, everything yeah. is important. You know, your dust cover has got to be 24 inches cause you're just, you're going to be a shitty warrant officer if it's not exactly 24 inches, even though they're going to throw it in the hallway when you go to class anyway. Right. It's so, it, 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 it was ridiculous. Um, so you go there for, you know, you do your five weeks there. Um, and just cooperate to graduate. Now, do they pin W1 on you right then? You don't have to go any type of additional training. Like? No, so you, you pin W1 at the end of candidate school. Okay. But now the Army, the Army considers you, you are a W1 non-branch qualified. Even yeah. though you had an assignment that you went there and you're going back to. Right. So but you're, but they're you, not going to assign you to that. Yeah, so for me, they did. Because I was TDY return, but what they look at it as, you're a warrant officer, you're... When you showed up, you're an NCO. Like that's gone. Yeah. Right. So you're a warrant officer, but you are not. You are not a branch qualified warrant officer. So I had to go to a Fort Huachuca for 12 weeks to get qualified. Okay. So again, dumb question. Did you go there and you find that what you just did now as a warrant officer really wasn't at a senior level than what you already knew from your experience as a master sergeant? Oh, WBC? Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. WBC for us, right, and I can only speak for me, was a complete regurgitation of BNOC. Um, every project that we I did. It to be painful for at you. It was incredibly painful. And yeah. I'd already been, by this point, I'd already been to the CI case officer course. Um, and, you know, everything that we did in BNOC was the exact same thing that we did in WBC. And it was just like, when do we do the technical stuff? Um, they didn't appreciate that question. Yeah. Um, at when, all. When do I learn something I, I don't already know? Right. right? You know, when yeah. do when do I learn to be a you know a true technician? When do I learn the the officership? Right. You right. know, piece. They don't they don't teach that at all. So that's something that you get once you get back to your unit. That well, that's what you're through supposed mentorship. to get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right yeah. through through mentorship. Yeah. Which. <laughs> Because you get back to your unit and, you know, they're like, hey, welcome back. Uh, good job. Hey, your uh, next uh, your 1610, your TDY orders are on your desk. You leave next week. Nice. Yeah. You know, so. Um, and in between all of this, right, so all these things are changing going on. And, you know, schools, like, you know, you got deployments wrapped in there. Yeah. You know, a, a, as well. So, um I kind of hit my, I kind of hit my high water mark there. Um, things got repetitive. The, the op tempo was really, really, really taking a toll on the family. Um, so a really good friend of mine down at Fort Bragg uh, was PCSing uh, to move out to Texas so he could take his retirement assignment because he's from Texas. And, you know, people from Texas are like Texas, like it's, uh, you know, they got to go back to the Republic of Texas, um, you know, so they, they can we go had back a to conversation it. about this last <laughs> night. As a matter of fact. Yeah. So they can go back to the, you know, to, to the homeland. Yeah. Um, so he hit me up and he was like, hey, man, you know, do you want to come down and, you know, uh, go through assessment selection? See, so you, you know, you, you want to replace me. Um, and so at the time, the way his position was, he didn't do a whole lot of TDYs. There was not a whole lot of, you know, away time. Um, and so, you know, Nicole and I talked it over and we were kind of done with DC traffic. We mm. were done with DC cost of living. Um, this whole thing of living inside the beltway, outside the belt. Don, actually, you did that. You ended up living I up did. there. Yeah, I did. You actually enjoyed it, though. I did. But yeah. I lived closer to where I didn't live out where you would have to get in a vehicle and drive. So oh, nice, that, yeah. that, that made it. I paid a little more, but I didn't have to 
drive. Yeah. No, that's good. The uh, it just sucks the it just sucks the life out of you. Mm. You know, it's like, oh, you need to go twenty miles away. That's two hours, one way. Like that's a two hour evolution one way. Oh, thank you. California is yeah. the same way. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just like well, Atlanta traffic's the same way. Yeah. Right. So. Like you spend a quarter of your day in your car. Yeah. Right. Like my commute now is 30 miles. I can do it in 30 minutes, yeah. you know, um, unless I get stuck behind a you know military vehicle um, <laughs> or something like that. But other than that, it's like it's fantastic. It's just a, it's a, you know everyone's always like oh Californians are always late to everything. It's like because you it, you cannot be on time for anything. There's traffic. I mean, you have to plan two hours for a 30 mile drive, you know, and then yeah. even then you're not even sure if you're going to make it on time. So. Yeah, it was crazy. And you can't pattern the D.C. traffic either. You know, it's not like, oh, well, it's a work day. It's, you know, right. 435 o'clock. You know, yeah. traffic's going to be bad. Like, you can get on 95 going yeah. south on a Saturday morning at 8 yeah. o'clock, and it's a parking lot. Yep. And it's for no good reason. It's either volume or somebody's changing their tire on the side of the road. Yeah. Everybody's got to stop and look. Or construction. construction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or, or, or a cop has somebody pulled over and everybody wants to slow down. It's like, dude, he's got somebody pulled over. He's not pulling you over. Yeah. Scoot on by. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so at that point, we were, you know, we were like, okay, let's, you know, let's make this, let's make this jump. Um, so you know, went down uh, assessment selection again, um, you know, messed around, got hired. And uh, so that's kind of. Was it what you thought it was in terms of uh, not as much going on the road or? No. Okay. <laughs> Cause I, mm-hmm. so I, 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 get there and they kind of rewrote the position description. Oh, nice. Um, it was <laughs> like, Hey, so he did that because he was really good at that. And like yeah. he bought that, he bought but a skill not. set that I did not have right. to that. So they're like, okay, you're going to do this. So I brought a different skill set and they're like, well, you fit easier in over here doing this that we need done. So you're going to do this. And, uh, Oh, by the way, you have a meeting in DC day after tomorrow. We need you there. Right. Oh, so, like, so you get to go right back. So I get to go right back. Um, so yeah, that was he had uh, a TDY skill set. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, there was some year, you know, up at Fort Meade, like there were years there, like I averaged um, anywhere between 160 to like 220 something days on the road a year, um, and that man, that's a that's a lot. Yeah. Um, and so on, now this is on top of deployments. If you had a deployment, yeah, that was on that was on top of deployment. Yeah. Um, hopefully, you know, your deployment kind of, you know, fell over, you know, crisscross two years, two calendar years, um, where you kind of mitigate some of that because they were. It, it was kind of at the point where they were, they they still kind of cared about Paris Tempo, but they didn't care. Yeah. Um, and so, but you know, it, the story there was we were shorthanded. We were only like twenty guys, <coughs> you know, supporting an incredibly large community. Um, you know, both in the States and overseas. So, you know, it was, if I don't go, somebody's going to. Mm-hmm. Um, so, no, so I got, you know, got down to brag and they were like, okay, you fit in easy over here with your skill set. We're going to have you do this. And so it was like back on that TDY train and then, you know, deployments where there what deployments. So what I sold to Nicole was absolutely not what Lovely. happened oh. in reality, right? So, yes. So you're betting a thousand about right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, I, I am. It, things are not. Things are not going well. Um, and so I did a rotation, came back for four months, and then had to do another rotation. And really, that was, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. That was the, okay, like I'm. Uh, like it's time I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm done and that was recently yeah yeah so because we're talking like months ago yeah so um, now when you look back at all this what would you have done differently you know I don't being a mechanic what's that <laughs> being a mechanic <laughs> no, <laughs> no <laughs> <going through damages. laughs> um I it's hard to say, I, you know, I, I, I don't like to look back and say I should have done this or I should have done that because what I did has, it's made me who I am today and it's put me where I am today. And, you know, the way I look at it, like I am blessed beyond words. I am blessed beyond measure. Um, you know, I have an amazing wife. I have three amazing daughters, um, you know, who every day, like, you know, with them, like it, it is truly a blessing 
And so if I was to go back and be like, oh, I would have done that different, maybe that would have set me on a different path that would have not turned out so well. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. it's, it's really hard for me to say I wouldn't have done this or I wouldn't have done that. I would say if I had, <laughs> if I had to choose one, I think at a certain point I would have stopped choosing the army over my family. Mm. Um, because I know there was absolutely times to where I was like, man, you know, Nicole's having, you know, the girls have, are having a really hard time at school or, you know, this is going on or, you know, that, but they need me to go TDY because they're short of body. And I would be like, baby, I got to go. Like, uh, you know, they told me I got to go. Um, you know, when in reality, that probably wasn't the case. But um, how many years actually did you end up spending? So... In two weeks, when I get my blue ID card, I will have 22 years, three months, and 17 days. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not that I'm counting. Not that I'm counting. And four hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, I don't know that I would do, I, I, I would have done anything different. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, you know, it's like looking back, it's like, man, I wish I would have bought Apple stock, you know. Right. 15 years, well, well, you didn't. And yeah. so here you are. So, you know, your windshield's bigger than your rearview mirror for a reason. Yeah. Um, well, I think we talked about that a little bit uh, yesterday, Paul and I, because um, we were talking about how every decision that you make through life ends up causing something later on. So, you know, if you make a decision, right or wrong, you're now on a trajectory or a path, and each decision from that takes you to a different one. And if you do start looking back, then you start saying, okay, well, maybe if I'd have done this, it'd have been kind of cool, or I could have done. And then somebody slaps you back to reality and goes, yeah, but look where we might have been today had that happened. Right. Because that trajectory would have taken you in a totally different direction. And we might have been at a very different place. Or you might not have even been here right now. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, yeah. I, absolutely. Um, and it, again, like, you know, I, I will say the last probably out of all, you know, out of all my deployments, um, you know, I, I have been, again, I've been blessed, man. I, you know, I've been to Central South America. I've, you know, I deployed to Africa, um, you know, to Europe, to the Middle East. Um, I have gotten to see, you know, a lot of the world. Um, and, uh, but, you know, out of all of that, I would say the hardest thing that I have done in the Army is transition. <laughs> that has been, really? that has been the hardest thing. All the schools, all the, tra- all the deployments, you know, Six months in, but you knew you made the decision to do this, though. So no, absolutely, absolutely. You knew it was coming. When when did you make the decision? Better yet, so was it three or four months ago? No, so I made the decision when I was still deployed. And they say never make a career decision while you're deployed. It's generally a bad idea. Um, I went ahead and I did that again. You know, I I, I did it again because I'm me. um, And when you tell me not to do something, I'm probably just going to go do it. But I knew during that deployment, um, the kids, we moved them out of Maryland and they have been there for so long. Like my oldest daughter went through the same elementary school, right? So she's got that core group of friends. Um, You know, my youngest daughters are there. Like everybody in the school knows all three of them. Um, You know, they're straight A students and everything. But we just kind of ripped them out of there and mm. brought them down to North Carolina where they don't know anybody. And at that age, it was really hard. So that yeah. transition was incredibly difficult for them. So Nicole was, I, it, she was having a hard time, um, you know, doing that. And here I am off, you know, jotting around, you know, the country and the globe. Um, and so, you know, she's, she's back, you know, she's a little Dutch boy with her fingers in the dam. And, I, you know, I finally looked back and I was like, like, I can't do this anymore. And so during that deployment, I made the decision. I was like, when I get back, I'm, I'm dropping my notice and retiring. Um, you know, it, yes, I asked for it. Yes, I said I'm retiring. I knew it was coming, but I did not think it would be as difficult as it has been. Hmm. And what is, what is it that you find so difficult about it? Is it a specific thing or is it kind of everything? Th- I think it's a little bit of everything, right? You know, so like the military, you know, basic training is like, okay, we're taking your identity away from you. We're giving you a new identity. And, you know, as hard as people trying to fight it, you know, it's hard that like that is you like that is, it's not all of you, right? Because there is life after the military. There is life after all of this, you know, but like that is that, that shaped you for the rest of it for sure. You know, um, how old were so, you when you joined up? 
What's that? How old was you when you joined? I was 20. So you've been in the service longer than you'd been alive before you joined? Yeah, I, uh, yeah I've been in the, so I've the been majority in the of your yeah. life has been spent in the military. And I think that's why people find it so difficult to, to get out and be able to transition out into something they don't understand because your, your life has existed within that military bubble and then you've got to go out and totally. find who you are, redefine yourself and, and what's, what's after your life, what? what's for your life after this line. I, I equate it a little bit to prison again, <laughs> where, <laughs> you know, every day you know what you're doing. Every day you know what yeah, you're wearing, kind of you know your yeah. job, you know that, you know, from one hour to the next hour, it, it, your life is kind of already planned out for the most part. And then, it, and we're all wanting that freedom. We are all looking for that freedom. It's like, oh, I only have to do so many more years and then I'll be free, I'll be free. And then you're free and it's like the doors close behind you and it's, you're in this big world yeah. <laughs> without the routine <laughs> and you know everything that you've known your entire adult mm. life and you know if, if even when you do prepare for it and even when you do have things set up you're just it's not it's a different mentality now you're you know having to integrate in in you know civilian life who people don't really understand you so there's a big element i think of loneliness that comes with it and especially if you move away from you know the people that you know or the the geography that you know too you know now you're you're trying to go back to this normal you don't even know what normal is anymore because normal before was when you were in high school <laughs> so yeah, it, is, exactly. it is completely different everyone's different everyone's grown and, and moved on and you know you're in your mind if you go back to your home it's it's supposed to be the same way it was when you were 18 and then it's not so it's yeah, I mean, I think no matter how much you try to prepare yourself, you're not really prepared. And it's it's funny. We spend so much time talking about with our own short timers attitude. OK, so like, you know, hey, I'm 12 months out, guys, you know, that much 22 days. Yeah. And we do that for a whole year. Yeah. But we're not planning for it. No. Well, no. it's interesting because you said you, you know, the whole thing about not making a decision while you're deployed. And I can, you know, not only did I make that decision deployed, I, I submitted the retirement paperwork deployed nice and and i had a guy that i knew for a while and we talked about you know when are you going to be done and when it, and he just said he had told me he's like one day you're going to know you're done mm -hmm. and that day is could come next week it could come next year but you're going to wake up and you're going to be done and i wasn't i didn't make it off a angry decision i didn't make it off of it just was you know what? I'm tired of this. Yeah. And I was going to do something. It's like Forrest different. Gump running down the road. I mean, yeah. it was. I wasn't. I wasn't. It wasn't a hastily decision as far as somebody said something or something happened and I'm going to leave. Mm -hmm. I just was like, I'm at a point and with a rank and this and you know what? I just don't want to do this anymore. So. Yeah. I didn't really, you know, one of my really good NCOs early on, you know. I, the same thing it was like you know when do you know when is when it was like you'll know everybody's different you'll just know yeah. and he he gave me three criteria that he used he was like when one of these criteria is met i'll know it's time and it was you know it negatively impacts my family mm -hmm. i'm not having fun anymore and i'm not value added and so he was like it, you know no order of precedence just but when one of those is one of those trip wires is tripped that's it. That's when you know you're done. And so, like, I, I carried that with me. And on that deployment, like, two out of those three were tripped. And I was like, it's, it's Tom. Right. Yeah. That's um, really good advice that you don't, like, set it on one principle, that you actually used a multiple, you know, set there that all three of them, well, in your case, you did two out of three. But, I mean, you know, you, you at least set something up where it's not, well, if this happens, because you may actually set something that probably will happen. Because right. yeah. you want it to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. So, uh, but that was good. And, and I think we all made the decisions in that way. I want to jump, though, to, like, I noticed a lot of this stuff because uh, I follow you on different accounts within social media. Uh-oh. Um, and, and I know that you, like, really get into. We're not Can gonna you explain this photo? We're not going <laughs> to get into the politics side of this. But, but the cybersecurity is something that I know that you have a lot of knowledge on as well. And, um, you know, Scott jokes with me all the time that I wear a tin hat. And, you know, because I'm concerned about uh, Siri and, and all these other crazy things listening in. But this, this is kind of what I think you kind of do in, within your real day job in that 
you use different devices in different ways in order to spy or listen in or so anyway kind of help me with that and what your thoughts are on some of the latest technologies and how we have to prepare for what's happening because as I understand it, and I know I'm asking a lot, but as I understand it, we're, we're growing so fast now in terms of technology. It's, it's getting a little scary, um, or could. Rob, are you really trying to ask if you should switch back to a flip phone? Because I, like, <laughs> I feel like- Yes, really a burner asking. phone. Are you gonna yes. get you a, cri a, 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 a cricket phone? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so like, so <clears throat> when, when I use electronics, it's not for, like we don't use it on a spot. Like we are looking for, you know, we are looking for devices that somebody has implanted to where they are trying to spy on you. We're trying to find those, right? So it's not necessarily for, for, for me to me to spy or anything. Um, and so like cybersecurity, the, the cyber piece of the counterintelligence field is like, it's one small part of what we do. Um, but the technology is there, it's scary. Um, you know, part of- um, See Scott, it's scary. So like, <laughs> so, you know, part of that, it, it, the. The biggest thing is, you know, to educate yourself on what's out there and what, you know, the capabilities are. Um, and so I will say, you know, so you know, I figure out how to, how to put this because there's a lot to unpack here. Um, you know, from the, from the cyber side, like, so starting a company on the side, right? And one of the things that we're going to do is consult to individuals, you know, trying to push into the private sector, get out of the government sector. Um, but, you know, consult, like, looking at people. So, like, let's take your house, for instance. Um, you know, everything is Wi-Fi now. Um, you know, your refrigerators, right? Your, your thermostat. refrigerators have Wi-Fi. Your thermostat is Wi-Fi. Yeah. Your, My pool. You know, if you have a pool, pool you, know, you can set it up. So, yeah. You, right. You, right. Your pool pump is Wi-Fi. Your sprinkler system yep, yep. that you put in your yard, you, have they have them now it. to where you can set that up on your Wi-Fi. Your yep. ring doorbell. Yes. You know, so your ring doorbell, all of that stuff is tied back into your router right for your house and what else is tied into that router what else connects to that router yep all of your electronic devices yeah um so you know your phones your ipads your macbooks your whatever you have right your xboxes your playstations so all that stuff ties back into that and so when you buy something that has a you know that has wi-fi capability like you're increasing your you're, you're increasing your attack point footprint Right. So there's multiple ways now that somebody could get into your your house and they could I mean, they, you know, they can shut your refrigerator off. They can shut your thermostat. Well, they they can do say, everything. Well, I was going to say, though, let me play the devil's advocate because I can see Scott already kind of lightening up of that. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, so it's like, OK, you can cut my refrigerator off. You can cut my pull off or you can stop my water sprinkler from working. So who cares? What's the big deal? You know what? <laughs> I can also decide, you know, I can disable your alarm system if you have one. Um, and it's on Wi-Fi. There was a case right. in the UK recently, uh, quite close to where I live, that somebody hacked into the Ring doorbell mm -hmm. and was watching um, the routine of the family, yep. what time the kids went to school, what time the kids come home, what time the husband went to work uh, and the wife didn't work. And then there was the ability, there's a microphone and a speaker built into it, isn't there? So yep. you can you know, explain to someone. So he was then transmitting to the wife when she was on her, on, her, on, on her own, threatening her, basically trying to blackmail her to say, if you don't pay X amount of money, I'm gonna take your children and, and because I know they finished school at this time. Dude, there's a movie on this. I can't remember the name of it. It's an older movie. Um, I, I don't remember how many years ago it was and I can't remember the name of it. Um, but at any rate, um, there's a guy who created an application. Everything in his house is wired, like, like you're talking about, right? And so this guy that he hired in, he wants to manipulate not only this, this system, but he wants to manipulate the guy. So he ends up, because he's got a daughter, he's a, it's a perfect attack operation, you know? He gets to befriending her and, and all of that kind of stuff. And now he can tap into the home systems, the home cameras, you know, and everything else and, and basically raid this guy's life and start ruining it and hold him for ransom mm, for these th very purposes. I think the key for me is, is you've got to put your trust in those companies with people like Josh. Oh, who, and you do that? Yeah. <laughs> Why would you not? Okay. Why, why would you not why trust would you me? Not put your, <laughs> as, a, as a society, why would you not put your trust in corporations and businesses with, that are putting out technology? Scott, that's a whole other podcast. So it we is. Can end up getting, but, but, 
That's personally, and, and you know, that's well, my opinion. And, what, and what option do you have, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, Otherwise, you, you live you, you live in the mountains, on, you know, with with a, a, a wind turbine for your power. Right. <laughs> so, and tinfoil hats. So, so, Josh, should we trust the companies that are? You should trust <laughs> my company, right? You should hire my company. And trust <laughs> my we, company we should right? all employ. Oh, sh- shameless, <laughs> shameless plug. Um, so you know, you've increased. You know, so all these things are Wi-Fi, right? Yeah. So now let's talk about your car. Yes, yeah. so let's talk right. about the car. So let's talk about your car. Talk, talk about how you can get into the, uh, the tires and everything. So. All right, so it, there, there's a video on YouTube to where there's a Prius, and they hacked a Prius and remote controlled it, you know, from across a parking lot. Yeah. So, you know, your, your tires tell you that your, you know, your left front tire is low. How does it do that? It's sending a signal right. to your engine, to your vehicle, Hey, I'm low. You know, cars are now coming with hotspots. Yes. Wi-Fi hotspots. Yeah. Anything. Well, that's that, very cool because now I can use my phone and everything while my kids are in the car and the whole bit, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So what you know, again, if it emanates a signal, then it can be exploited, right? And so we just keep increasing that those, those attack points, right? We keep increasing that footprint to where, you know, it's it's great. It makes it convenient. Everybody like everybody wants a seamless experience with whatever they're doing. Um, and you can get, even get into facial recognition in the biometrics piece, you know, hotels are going to facial recognition by the point you make it to the desk, or, you know. They already know who you are. Hello, Mr. Robert. Yeah. Welcome back. So right? so in the tire situation, why isn't I can't attack through your tire into your engine, shut your brakes off and disable your car? Yeah, you can absolutely do that. You yeah. can do whatever you so want to do. So just so we're clear. Yeah, but the issue is 99% of the population can't do that. But you trust the manufacturer of that automobile yeah. that that will never and occur. That they've got firewalls and built-in security to prevent to that. You. Huh? What are you doing that somebody might want to do this to you? Maybe your spouse wants to collect on that insurance policy. Oh. You know why? You shouldn't have married that I don't spouse. know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, maybe it could, it could be anything. Maybe Wait, it's not so the something. Spouse can hire your company to do. Is that what you're... <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, maybe it's you know maybe it's something else. Maybe they don't. Maybe they don't want to hurt you. Maybe it's a kidnapping for ransom um, situation, mm-hmm. right? So you're you're in that vehicle and you're overseas somewhere, and there's some you know just a regular criminal element that wants to kidnap you for ransom because you're someone of some notoriety who may have or family may have access to funds. I think we're, um, we're thinking a little bit too small here because what happens when you shut down every single Prius in L.A.? Yeah. What happens when you <laughs> shut down every Prius? What shut down all your Teslas? Every single well, smart fridge. You've got to do it at 6 a.m. Yeah. so nobody can go in. I mean, that's, how, that's where it's going. At a certain point, if every single home, home has a smart fridge and that is vulnerable to attack and you shut down a million of them. Yeah. But that's the whole point of cybersecurity specialists. And that's right. what they're trying and to I prevent. Yeah. So, it, so what's interesting about this is everybody probably had this happen. I guess it was, um, what was it, about a year and a half ago. I'm sitting with a client and in, in my office of this client's facility and stuff. And there's two guys and I'm doing this whole discussion and we're planning about how we're going to talk to you know, a, a leadership <laughs> team about something specific. And all of a sudden the phone goes off and I go, what the heck is that? And they go, it's the president, the test message, you know, yes. it just worked. And so I, these, one of the guys sitting there is former military, mm-hmm. and we both look at each other wide-eyed, and they go, you do know what that means, right? If you can actually send a message to every cell phone in America by the president, that means anybody has the opportunity now to do the exact same thing. Well, not anybody, right? but a determined individual. Huh? Well, not anybody. But Somebody, so anybody with the trip. capability, right? Yeah. So they have to have right. the capability, right. right? So right. capability, motivation, mm-hmm. and right, yeah. justification. And, 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 and intent, the intent and, to yeah, do and it. And want to do that. Right, yeah, for sure. Because you, you've got guys like yourself who've got the capability, but you haven't got the Ooh, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, so much more than a slot on this modest. side of the table. Yeah, no, so I'm still, I'm still an analog dude in a digital world myself, right? <laughs> so I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to get smart, smarter on it, um, you know, and so... But there's, there, there's so much out there. All of our information is out there, right? So you go back to the, to the OPM data breach, um, right? Think about what was in, you know, that paperwork for your security clearance. Um, not just your information, but your, you know, your immediate family members. Like all their information was in there. Um, uh, real quick, for those who are listening and don't know what OPM is, that's Office of Personnel Management. So that's the entity that does all your background checks. So 
they check your family, all your known acquaintances. If you join the military at 18 and go become a ranger or something, that's everybody. You that's where your military, your, wife, your military much. record is at, period. Yes, also yeah, that. Yeah. So it's like not just you, but everybody you yeah. know. Yeah. That's been breached. So, you know, that information coupled out there, now I know where you live. Okay, so now, now I can pinpoint that. Okay, you, I get there. You can there. find that on Google, though. Probably if you did enough search nowadays. Well, it, it depends, like right? So I take that OPM information I'm looking at. Where does that person work, all right? That, okay, they work at a facility or, you know, a place that has information that I want, right? So I'm going to go target that person, right? Yeah. Um, you know, now I, you know, I find your house on 123 Main Street. And, okay, now there's all these attack points that I have because you got that cool sprinkler system. <laughs> yeah. You know, stuff that you control from your, you know, your smartphone. And then I come into your car. And then Robert's sitting in your car in your garage when you walk out in the morning. <laughs> Super weird. But I'm okay because I've got the tinfoil hat, so I'm good. <laughs> so, uh, Josh, I really appreciate you coming on the show, man, and, and talking um, about your whole situation. I think there's much to be learned because I don't think we've ever had anybody that's counterintelligence. You know, we have a lot of people that come from very dis different backgrounds. And the fact that you came from, you know, the special operations community in a different MOS, I think it sheds a new light on, you know, a different field other than combat arms, you know, infantry, you know, and those types of things that people typically associate with special operations forces. And there's so many different MOSs that actually could be tied to special operations in your classic example of that. Yeah, for sure. I really appreciate you. I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, and I just take like, you know, a couple seconds to, you know, to, to, to plug this uh, real quick. So like, so you're absolutely right. You know, what we, me and a couple of guys were writing a book. Um, and that book is basically just a, a collection of short stories um, and it's from, you know, just support guys and it's our stories. Um, you know, 2.7 million Americans have served in Iraq and Afghanistan and everybody's story needs to be told. You know, um, growing up, my sister had a project. She interviewed my grandmother who sewed parachutes together, you know, in a during World War II. And I was just, uh, you know, those stories and, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely amazing to sit there and listen to those, right? So it wasn't, you know, D-Day assaulting Omaha Beach or anything like that, but it was a story of, you know, somebody who was involved. And so, you know, we're gonna, we're putting together this compilation um, and, uh, you know, er everybody has a story and everybody needs to, ha needs to tell their story, um, regardless of, of, of what they did. Uh, or, or where they did it at. So. Well, I appreciate that. Actually, that's the reason why we did the whole podcast, because we really believe that. We believe that, you know, what you share and the knowledge like this episode here that you ended up, you know, talking about your background and everything else, there's something somebody can take away from it. And even if it's one person, two people or whatever, they get something out of it, um, then there's an opportunity there that they could make a career choice change. They may not head down the same path you did because you put them on a different trajectory and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I was going to make that decision. Josh didn't do it, so maybe <laughs> you know, maybe I'll end up like Josh or, hey, maybe I don't want to end up like Josh you know, or whatever the situation may be. So I can totally see that. Um, I wish you much success with your book. Um, when can we expect that, by the way? Um, so right now we're shooting for uh, a release date of about 20 April. Um, we'll have a pre-order uh, you know, up this year be before then. Yeah. Yeah, this hey, year. You're full of all kinds of secrets you haven't shared with me. I've, right? I've got a lot of I've got a lot of irons in the fire. Uh, there may be a uh, there may be a podcast coming out too. No, Who knows? really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So good I, deal. All right. Well, I look forward to following you and hearing more about it and everything else. So um, again, appreciate you coming on the show. All right. Thanks for having me.